All right, welcome back. Welcome to the After Church. I'm glad that uh, you are here. So let's go ahead and get started and we'll start taking some questions. Um, it is um, almost 12 o'clock and so we're actually getting a, a little bit of an early start. So let's uh, pray and then we will um, get going. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are once again grateful to not only have the time, the ability, but the inclination to dive deeper into your word. Um, we, we're, we're thankful that there's no depth to this word. I, mean, I don't mean it that way, that there's no bottom to the word. We'll never find the depth of it. We'll continue all of our lives uh, digging deeper and deeper and deeper into it. So um, we will give you the glory. We pray that you will reveal to us uh, the things you want to reveal to us, that the questions will be answered that are asked, and uh, it will all be to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Did I move that too far in front of the mic? Sorry, I, I mean, I, I'm not moving it back. I just want to move it to where it's not in front of the mic. Okay. Okay. Okay, is that better? Test, test, one, two, test, test, one, two. Okay, well, we'll, we'll leave it there. All right. Okay, um, let's take some questions first of all, as far as uh, what we talked about today. And then we'll go from there. Miss Rhonda. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it's not even a Pharisee, but it's Luke that um, identifies this woman as a sinner. Right. Um, you know, throughout um, Scripture, uh, um, God's word, word calls us saints. Yeah. Once we're redeemed, not still identifies us as a sinner. Yeah. Um, you, you know, that brings up a really interesting point about this whole passage. And um, I, I, di I didn't slow down to, to discuss this, but... I, for instance, the timing is off a little bit here. Um, in other words, they're, they're, the resurrection hasn't come yet, the crucifixion hasn't come yet, the Pentecost hasn't come yet, and we're talking about people redeemed and atoned for and things like that. I, I mean, we know that we're jumping the gun, but in a very real way, I think very similar to that story of the young man who was raised from the dead at Nain. And we said, okay, this is historical, but at the same time, it is so representative of God's plan of redemption that even though this happened and this was a real woman, that she is representing things that she couldn't possibly have known and things that are are coming together. And so therefore, I think that the reason specifically that she is identified as a sinner is to make the point that Jesus is going to make when we look at it next week, when, when she says that the one who has been forgiven much loves much. And so therefore, she was identified more as a sinner. But towards that thought, notice that she wasn't, it wasn't identified the nature of her sin. Okay, it, it wasn't, okay, she was a prostitute, you know, because she, really she represents a woman redeemed at this point. And, and so there, it, it, even though she was a almost professional sinner, she is redeemed and that makes all the difference in the world. And that's the big comparison. If you'll notice in Luke, and it's been over and over again, that Luke is showing us that okay, this isn't adding up the way that you might expect it to add up. Here, I'm going to give you all the ethical standards of the kingdom and what real discipleship means, and then I'm going to give you an example of a Roman centurion and not the Jewish elders, you know, backwards from the way that it ought to be. And so now John the Baptist comes and asks about, are you the Christ? And, and Jesus, of course, answers that he is. He gives that parable about the gospel. You're rejecting both the judgment of God and you're rejecting the grace of God. You're like kids in the marketplace. Let me, let, let me give you an example of someone who really is impacted by the real gospel and it's a woman of ill repute. You, you know, it, it, these themes are running throughout Luke's gospel. So, yeah, yeah, you, you know, uh, 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 there are so many, so many things going on. In fact, that's one of the things, if we have time, I'll, I'll go into it a little bit deeper. Some, some of the themes that are actually being brought together here. Yes, Brother Will. Yes, it should be. Well. 
Okay, uh, I have two mics. This one only goes to the internet. Okay, th this is solely going through the computer. This one is probably being impacted a little bit by the, the speakers. Okay. Test, test, one, two, one, two, three. <clears throat> so, so Ms. Bobby, it's a trade-off, right? <laughs> e e either you can hear without trouble or there's gonna be feedback, one or the other. Uh, you know, so we'll, we'll, we'll just keep working at it and we'll, we'll get it right. Yes, ma'am. something I think we'll probably end up talking about next week. But oh, you can answer, I can answer it now. Typically what happened is as soon as you came in off the street, the lowliest servant in the house washed your feet. So it, it, I don't think it was, you know, after the Last Supper, it was very ceremonial that Jesus did to set the tone of what it really means to be a disciple. Um, and the kind of Lord that he was. But it, typically at a, an event like this, there should have been a washing of the feet when he came in, okay? That was, that was denied him, uh, specifically. So, uh, well, he, he, he didn't wash his feet. It, it, it was the common courtesy that the lowest servant, uh, servant in the house is at the door. When you walk in the door, you get your feet washed. So everyone that, else would have had their... I'm assuming, I'm assuming. Luke doesn't say that, but this is a, a slight um, at Jesus. And, and we'll get to this next week. In the tone of voice of the Pharisee, everything he says is done in a demeaning fashion. You know, like Jesus says, Simon, I've got something to say to you. His response is, oh, Lord, what is it? It's say it, Lord. You know, it really kind of, uh, everything he does is kind of a dig at Jesus. So we'll see that. So we assume, and, and again, this is an assumption, but I'd make the assumption that everyone else at the table has, has, has all been, had their feet washed. Maybe they were all there early and then Jesus came in the last, um, but they did not wash his feet, okay? Which, which, which makes a beautiful picture of the woman's raining tears on him and making, muddying his feet. Yeah, but, so my, my question is, the, the rest of the people that were there, would they, they would have knowledge of the fact that Jesus was slighted? Oh, I, I, I'm assuming. Okay. I'm assuming. You, you know, these are the, the kinds of assumptions that when we try to visualize this that we make. But again, I think that there's pretty good evidence in this passage to, to get that, that there's an animosity there and, and that, that, that a common courtesy, especially for a celebrated dinner guest, was withheld from Jesus. Okay, um, we'll, we'll get there. Yes, ma'am, you had a... You, 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 and again, these, these are the nuances, um, and, and we're reading into it, but I think it's a very, very valid uh, assumption. The woman did not come there to hear Jesus speak. You don't bring an expensive bottle of alabaster, I mean, alabaster bottle of perfume. I mean, I, I mean, hundreds of dollars of value to us. You don't bring that to anoint someone that you haven't had some experience with. So it is my impression that when Jesus says your sins are forgiven, that that's not the first time that that has happened or that understanding has occurred. Her weeping, uh, her, her love expressing, I mean, how did she get the love of Jesus to the point that she's gonna do that there? There has to have been some previous contact 
of some kind of, maybe she heard him speak and, and the, the, the spirit reached right through to her heart. But I believe that this is an act of worship. Now, you don't worship unless you have come to that recognition of, of, of the spirit and, and, and what this, she might not have been able to articulate it or known what's going on, but I get the distinct impression that, there, that this is an act of worship as the result of her awe over being saved, over being redeemed, so, uh, released from her sins. So she recognized Jesus as God. Well, I don't know that she recognized him as God yet. I mean, that is a very, it's easy for us to say because we're looking backwards at 2,000 years of scholarship and our, our own teaching. But her, I, I think that maybe she couldn't have articulated exactly what happened to her, but she recognized that this man who can only do the works of God, you see later on, we didn't get to it today, we're gonna get to the idea of faith because Jesus is gonna say, your faith saved you. So how does she have faith? Where did that faith come from? You know, faith in what? You know, what did she do? Except to express her love for Jesus and, and worship. So I don't know that she could have articulated that Jesus was God, but I think that she recognized that, right, that, that the, the, the Spirit had convicted her that Jesus had the authority to forgive sins and that her sins were forgiven. She doesn't know about the cross. She doesn't know about the resurrection. She doesn't know about the atonement because all of that is yet to come. Once again, this is what I call a living parable. It is a real life historical event that tells a story. Okay, and it's telling us the story 2,000 years later of how we should worship because this woman is showing the signs of that kind of worship, the same kind of worship we should have. Yeah, yes ma'am. Is this the same story that John told? Uh, um, no, it's not. Okay, with two different store, two two different places. Okay. Um, one is on the Wednesday before Jesus is crucified, in Beth Bethany, okay. just outside of Jerusalem, and it's Mary, the sister of Lazarus, that does it there. Okay, okay? and remember Judas got upset at her for wasting all that money uh, anointing Jesus' feet. There's a different, a little bit of a different emphasis there. It's almost like a goodbye. It's almost the perfume of the gospel that is going to permeate uh, all the way to the cross and beyond. It's almost like the establishment of the church. But once again, these are gorgeous images of the bridegroom and his bride. And that, that bride is defiled, okay? And Jesus purifies. And, and that's us, that's the church. You know, so these are all beautiful pictures, not just of forgiveness and faith and worship, but this is the church coming at the feet of Jesus. You know? So yes, it's a different story. Some people try to make it the same, but it's totally different, different place, different time. So the only people that actually press that are the ones who say this was all kind of made up, you know, because the facts are different. You know, you, you, if, if you ignore biblical facts, right, and you say all of this was, these are all great stories, Jesus lives in our heart, but he didn't really do all this stuff, th then the, those are the ones who, who try to say, well, obviously this is an example, two stories, very similar, telling it in two different guises, they're actually making this stuff up, but just trying to make it fit their, their narrative, okay? We, of course, don't believe that. So it would happen twice. Yeah. Okay, um, any further discussion on this hugely vital, um, deep, deep subject that we could talk about for months? And you had three questions. And so are you No, and I, I have no idea. I mean, that's a wonderful question, but you know, when, when the community came in, first of all, the community were kind of treated like second-class citizens anyway, all right, because they weren't invited to dinner and they weren't served. I mean, nothing. Now, they were on occasion, I am told, they were allowed to speak, 
and sometimes they can you get question from the peanut gallery, you know, if you will. But they were not included in the in the evening, mm -hmm. so maybe they were considered. But you see, the washing of feet was not just ceremonial; it was actually sanitary, you know, because you didn't want all that dirt and dust in your house. And um, so it, it's that, that's a very interesting qu question, you know, whether or not she had had her feet washed. Um, maybe they would have seen her painted toenails if she if she did, so she avoided that. You know, uh, it meant something different than in those days than it does today. Wow. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Absolutely, that is why. The job, that's why what happens in John 13 is so extraordinary. This is the God of the universe doing this. I mean, that's amazing that he did this. But it was the job usually. Uh, there was a very pronounced pecking order in a household, especially the larger households, um, amongst the slaves or servants, you know, who's in charge and who's not. That job was usually reserved for the youngest daughter of the lowest slave. That was the most humble job in the house. And um, uh, that's what Jesus chose to do, and that's what this woman chose to do. So even though providentially she's not able to get any place else, she's not able to find, um, get to his head, that's the beautiful picture that we want to see, the humility of worship, the subjugation of worship, the, the church at the feet of Jesus worshiping him in that guise or that sense. Yeah, it's a beautiful picture, you know, um, of humility. Humiliation in Scripture. The greatest humiliation is when God became man, when God took on the attributes of a human being and walked amongst us. That's the greatest imaginable, actually unimaginable, but the greatest example of humiliation. In fact, it's a formal doctrine, the doctrine of humiliation. Most people don't know that, that you have the doctrine of the incarnation, you have the doctrine of the humiliation that precedes that. Uh, and it's God in his love for us that's the only way. I mean, you, you look at it, there's no other way we're going to get saved if, unless God does it himself. And so it shows that great love and humiliation when he took on the attributes. So let me ask you a trivial question, or a, a trivial, not trivial, trivia question. Difference, uh, big difference in meaning. A trivia question there. What happened at the humiliation and the incarnation to the deity of the second member of the Godhead? Okay, God becomes man, walks amongst us, the Logos became flesh and tabernacled or dwelt among us. What happened to the glory of the Son as he takes on the attributes of a human being. How is it possible that he divested himself? How is it possible that he humiliated himself? The deity. The deity. Just leave it at the deity. Well, let me, let me, let me, let me read for you from Philippians 2. Okay, real simple. Okay, have this um, mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Okay, what actually happened? Did God diminish himself. How was God diminished at the humiliation without becoming not God? By adding the humidity, humanity. 
Yeah, it's addition and not subtraction. It, it, he, he didn't lose his divinity. He didn't lose his deity. That's why you hear me say all the time, he took on the attributes of humanity. And, 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 and that's, that, that's the, 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 the degradation or the humiliation of, of the Lord. I use the example all the time. You probably get tired of hearing the same examples, but I used to be a waiter in a Tux and Tails restaurants, and we served $100, $150 bottles of wine. And I'm talking, I'm not even going to tell you how many years ago. Uh, I, I mean, many, many, many years ago. And, um, you know, somebody spends that amount of wine, gets up and goes to the restroom, and they come back and their wine is in there in a glass with uh, ice, a little wedge of, uh, of lime and orange juice, and uh, a little, one of those little umbrellas in it. And, and the waitress is sitting there all abeam and says, um, are you the one who ordered this, the um, sangria? I made it right here at the table with your wine, okay? Is that wine still worth $150 a bottle? It's ruined, right? Not by subtraction, but by addition. You added orange juice to it. You added all the stuff you put in to a, a sangria, um, but you ruined the perfect, pure, ancient bottle of wine. So that's, in a sense, what happened at the Incarnation, God took on the attributes of a human being, not to, to lessen himself, but to be humiliated and diminished through addition. Okay. That's kind of a heavy, uh, a heavy aspect, a heavy thought. Um, let's talk about something else heavy, okay, while we're talking about heavy things, all right? Um, as is the case, it's kind of funny what happened last week, I told you, that I had tried to answer a question that you had brought from Anita and I didn't feel like I had done a good job. And so I wanted to answer it again. That question led to another question and I think I even answered that one even less because I couldn't think of any of the words and Joby uh, gave me one of them. But uh, here's what I want to do. I, I want to go back to that. And I think that, Will, you're the only one who was here yesterday, so you'll hear this again. The men talked about it extensively yesterday morning. Um, but I want to go back and I want to talk about these wills of God, when we talk about the will of God. And in particular, um, the, the, the question that I am always asked is out of Second Peter 3. Um, so I, I want to go to 2 Peter 3, I want to read what it says there, and then I want to talk about why this is not a contradiction, why it is not universalism, why it is not open theism, and why it's not even an explanation of Arminianism, okay? So let's take a look at the, that passage. If you have your Bibles, if not, just listen and I will um, read them to you. I'm going to start in the third chapter of 2 Peter at the eighth verse. Um, and I'm just going to read eight and nine. Okay. In fact, I might read a, a few more. Um, but do not overlook this one fact, Peter writes, um, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Okay? Now that is one of the commonly drawn up verses when people are struggling with the will of God. The wrong interpretation is the universalist who ignores the rest of the Bible. A universalist is the one who believes in the, the um, universal fatherhood of God and the universal brotherhood of man. In other words, all dogs go to heaven. No one is, is punished. Rob Bell, who supposedly at one time was evangelical, is complete and total heretic, wrote a book called Love Wins, and in that book he says, that God's love is greater than Hitler's sin. So Hitler goes to heaven, okay? Ignoring the rest of the Bible completely and, and explaining it away. Now, I won't say ignoring it because they do, they do explain it away. But when you look at this, um, you, you, you simply have to ignore everything, not only that the Bible says, 
but that Peter says when he talks about God's relationships with human beings. I mean, let's go back to the beginning of the third chapter, just right ahead of that. He says, now this is the second letter that I'm writing you, beloved, in both of them I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming forever since the Father? Others fell asleep. All things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation, for they deliberately overlooked the fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of whom? Now, so how do you ignore the very word before that and claim that this is a passage about universalism? The only way you can do it is to take it out of context. That's why you have to be so careful. Because when you get in these discussions or arguments with people about what the Bible says, they're going to go to their favorite verse, but they're going to take it out of context. And so even if I'm not aware of what they're saying, I, I'm, I'm not going to answer because I know from, from what I know about Scripture, it doesn't say that. So I may not know why it doesn't say that. So I go and research it. And, and all you got to do is read the verse before that and you realize it's not universalism. Okay, so when Peter says that God is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, not wishing that any should perish. So the question is, if God wishes something, how can it possibly not come to pass? If God is sovereign and he has the kind of will that we expect that he does. Okay? So, once again, universalism we're throwing out because we know that's not true. But now the Arminian comes along, and the Arminian, of course, is the one that says you have the free will choice to either choose God or reject Him. Okay? You, you, you make the choice. And so, therefore, since God does not want anyone to perish, He has made it possible that if you do perish, it's your own fault because you've chosen against Him, not because God, from all eternity past, chose His people. All right? Now, once again, there are two words here that we need to understand. One is the word any, not wishing that any should perish. And then the word, other word is wishing. Okay, what does he mean when God, when it says God wills or wishes or says that does not want anyone to perish? Well, if God doesn't want anyone to perish, if he doesn't gain any satisfaction out of the death of the ungodly, then that pretty much says it, doesn't it, right? God is not going to be thwarted in his will. Well, several things, and I, and, and I don't have time to go uh, too deeply into this, but I mean, if you go back and you, and you just read the opening verses of 1 Peter, and, and he's pretty much consistent throughout the whole book when he says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are what? Elect exiles. Okay, who's he writing to? The elect, the church, right? Th that's specifically addressed. So when we go to and he says, not wishing that any would perish, who's he referring to as any? The elect. And we already know that the elect will not perish. Uh, but then he goes on and, and he clearly states, the elect exiles of the uh, dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, um, according to what? The foreknowledge of God of the God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for the sprinkling with His blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. So Peter from one end of his book to the other makes it clear who he's talking to. Any are the elect. Well, of course, the Arminian denies that and says that's not possible. <clears throat> so he says that any refers to every person on earth. 
But still what I want you to see is that does not necessarily mean that if it says, and if it were to come out right and say, God wills or wishes that no one on earth would be lost, but that all would repent. Then if God wills it or wishes it, then why doesn't it happen? Which brings into our consideration what we started talking about last week, the names, these words escape me. There are more words than you can shake a fist. It's kind of like the medicine, you, you know, when you see all those big long words. Uh, the theologians sit around all day and try to think of words um, that, that you're, you know, you're easily going to forget. So I forget them, uh, and so I did last week. But there are three, there's many different types of God's will that are referred to in Scripture. But I want to zero in on the three major ones. Now, and I mentioned this to the men last, um, um, uh, yesterday morning, that there are three wills that God has. First, his, known as his decorative, or maybe it's easier to understand as decretive. You must remember, I'm from the South, I'm a Southern boy, we pronounce, mispronounce everything on purpose, okay? <laughs> Um, so it's either the decorative or the decretive will, that which God decrees. Okay, so that's the first will, his sovereign will. Then, I mispronounced it last week, I said prescriptive will, it's the preceptive will. It is the will that is written into his precepts, what he says, what he commands. And then there is what is known as his dispositional will that what God's disposition is, that he would want something or not want something. So we can take each one of those wills. Now, Dr. Sproul, when he handles this, by the way, wrote a book on this that is well worth it. If I, if I mess this up again, um, it's, I believe it's understanding God's will or something about God's will, knowing God's will. He, he goes into this in great detail. You can also find articles by him on Ligonier.com or .org. But, but nonetheless, um, he, he makes the, the, the statement that there are two words for will in the Greek. And it would be really nice if one meant one thing and another meant the other thing. It's kind of like when we look at the words for love and we, we want to make a big distinction between phileo, the, which is commonly referred to as brotherly love, or agape, which we see as sort of compassionate love. But the trouble is, is that when you go into the Greek, they're used interchangeably, you know, so you can't make that distinction. <coughs> Excuse me. You can't make that distinction um, based on the Greek. So you have to make the distinction out of context. So the three wills of God, the decretive will is that which God sovereignly decrees. Let there be light, and there was light. That he chose before the foundations of the world those that he would be called to be his own, his elect. Those are the decretive will of God. God decrees it. And when God decrees something, it is his sovereign will that it occurs. And if it is his sovereign will that it will, it will occur, it's impossible that God could be God and that will would not come to pass. So the decretive will is that will that everyone just assumes that every time that we see God wills this or God wants that, that he's talking about his decretive will. Well, if we look at this particular statement and we say that, okay, this is God's decretive will, then it's a false statement because it would mean that the Lord is not slow to show or to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish. Okay, if that's decretive, what does it mean? means no one will perish. None, not anyone is going to perish, not even Satan, okay? So there's no perishing. We know that's not true. We, we know that's completely not true from the rest of Scripture that he talks about perishing all the time. In, in fact, go to, go, go to John. For the, for, um, he did not come into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. 
and, and those who are who do not believe in the name of the Son. Of, um, the, well, I'm, I'm butchering them. But it, but anyway, it, it is that you're perishing already. You're, you're condemned already because you do not believe in the name of the only Son of God. Well, that's without question in didactic teaching that there are those who would be perishing. And so therefore, this cannot possibly be his decretive will. So could it be his preceptive will? What's the preceptive will? Thou, we, we recited it earlier, the Ten Commandments. God says, do not commit adultery. Do people commit adultery? They do all the time. Do not steal. Do not lie. Do not covet. All of those things. Do people still do that? Do not disobey your parents. Uh, uh, observe the Sabbath. And yet, people don't do it. And, of course, it's a sin against God. But it is not his decretive will that he says, because otherwise, when he says, you will have no other God before me, there would be no idols. There would be no other worshiping of any other God anywhere on the planet. By anyone, we would all be worshiping the one God because he declared it. He decreed it. Well, he didn't. So that's his preceptive will. This is, it's like the difference between ethics and morals that we talk about. Ethics are the standards. When God says his preceptive will, these are my standards for which you to live by. I'm not decreeing that everyone will live by. I am simply stating that these are my precepts. Well, since we know that people perish and that they don't perish necessarily. It, this could be the preceptive will if you really kind of pressed it, but it really doesn't fit. It doesn't fit that well. You could say that God decreed that, or, or that, that he made the, the precept that any sin would cause people to perish and, and, and that he, he, he stated that it is, it is my governing um, uh, uh, a will, my, my law, that no one should perish. Well, if it's his law and, and then someone perishes, they're sinning for perishing, which is, is, is really not, doesn't make an awful lot of sense. So it's not his preceptive will either. What this is, is what theologians call his dispos, dispon, I, I, I keep wanting to say dispensational, and, and, and it, I don't want it to come out that way. Dispositional will. Yes. Dispositional. It is his disposition. Okay? It is what God would prefer. It is what he would like. He, he, God gets no pleasure in sending people to hell. That's not what he actually intended or want. Well, take that back. Everything he intended has come to, comes to pass. But it's not his pleasure. And, and let me just give you a human example. Say that there is a judge, and it's a good judge, a, uh, a, a just judge, and his own son comes before him having robbed a bank, and in the process someone was murdered, and the law of that state clearly states that any murder of that such, they go to the electric chair. And the evidence is overwhelming against him. They've got him on camera. They've got the gun. They see him firing. And so the son comes before the father. What must the father do if he's a just judge? I, I, I have to send you to the electric chair. Does that mean that's his disposition? Does that mean that's what he wants to do or finds pleasure in doing, sending his son to the electric chair? Of course not. I would much rather let you go. But because the law states, okay, the preceptive will states that you transgress this, this is the punishment, then because of that preceptive will, which by the way, I decreed from all eternity past, you see how it comes down, the decretive will ends up in the perceptive will, the perceptive will, I have a disposition that you would keep the will, but if you don't, I've got to punish you. Okay? Does that make a little bit more sense out of all this? Okay. I'm getting this and I'm getting this. Uh, so, I, I, yes ma'am. Um, well, you know, the way I see it is God gave us free will to
qualify that statement just a wee bit, okay? Um, the, 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 there's a common misconception that human beings in their fallen state have complete free will. They can choose to follow God or reject Him. Actually, Scripture does not teach that. It doesn't teach that in our fallen state we have the ability to choose for God. And the reason is, is that you are dead in your trespasses and sins. Dead people cannot choose God. Dead people cannot choose to follow Him. And dead people cannot choose to worship Jesus. This is a gift. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. It is through a gift of faith that we have the ability to choose for God. When the heart is regenerated, no longer fallen, no longer at enmity with God, which means hating Him, then we have the ability to choose, in fact, the compulsion to choose for Him. Let me finish. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me stay uh, on the thought here. Now, we do have free will in the sense that we are completely free to choose according to our nature, okay? Now, if our nature is fallen and at enmity against God, then even though that's a free choice, it will always be the same choice. It will always be against God. The scripture does not teach that someone lost in their trespasses and sins, dead spiritually, can raise themselves from the dead and choose to follow God. So that's not complete and total free will. That's a free will to choose against God until your heart is changed and then you have a free will to choose for Him. But who changes our heart? The Holy Spirit. Okay, but so then are you saying that the Holy Spirit then chooses to whom He changes heart? Yes, God? absolutely. So, so then, that, that, then He elects it. And to me, that doesn't sound like a fair parent. Well, and that's, and, and, and please, please keep in mind, please keep in mind that it shouldn't feel fair to us because we're not God. We are fallen human beings with a fallen sense of fairness. And doesn't, I mean, read, read Romans 9. Read it carefully because God comes right out and, and Paul says, Am I not free to choose to make one vessel for good use and another vessel for bad use? Am I not free as the potter to make people un according to my purposes? And Scripture teaches from the very beginning that God chooses His people. The Israelites were chosen. I didn't choose you because you were more in number. I chose you because I loved you. And because I chose you out of all the people on earth to be my people, a nation of priests, Deuteronomy, Exodus, both of them say the same thing. Paul makes the same statement over and over again in his Gospels that we are, and, and I'll go back and read John 6. Read the sixth chapter of John and tell me when you come through with that, that you see that when Jesus says, no one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. No one comes to me, okay, on their own, unless the Father who sent me draws them. So if some people follow Jesus and some people don't, and the only way that those who follow Jesus do so because the Father draws them, that means he draws some and he doesn't draw others. A tough, a, 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 granted, a very tough thing to grapple with. I, I just challenge you I challenge you to put aside your preconceptions, put aside what you think, and delve into what Scripture says. Because that's our only guide. It's not what we think is logical, what we think works or doesn't work. It's what Scripture says. And so dive into what Scripture says and find me a passage where it definitively says that fallen human beings lost in their trespasses and sins have the ability, the free will choice to choose in their sinful state to follow God. You know, when I, when I think of the scripture, for God so loved the world that he gave his only because he loved the world, everybody. Right. It doesn't mean he doesn't love, just, because, just like the father who sends his son to the electric chair, it doesn't mean he doesn't love him. 
It means that that the son sinned against him. Yes, but it also, you know, what's confusing me is that it, it says that God has to grow you to be saved. Yeah. So then, then, and, and that he elects. So I am a little confused about well, well, it. Because the God that I know that I feel is the love of God is, is, is a fair God. It's a, well, he is. It's a just God. Okay, well, let, me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me put it this way. Talking about the fairness of God uh -huh. and a just God. I can tell you without question that not one innocent person will ever darken the gates of hell. Okay. Yes. Between fairness uh, and a human sense of fairness and justness, and God is perfectly just, and so therefore has to punish sin. It says so in Deuteronomy. But you you mentioned John three sixteen, uh -huh. okay? And I butchered it a, a little early. I'm going to read it, okay? Uh, I, I, j just to read a little bit now, keeping in mind what John six says, okay? Um, when when he says, "No one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws him." Okay, this is what John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, okay, world is a big word in John, means several different things, but let's not assume that it means that every single human being on the planet, but he, he does in a sense love every single human being on the planet. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that condition, whoever believes in him shall not perish, okay, so there's obviously some who will perish, shall not perish, but have everlasting life, have eternal life. He goes on, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, exactly what Will said, the world's already condemned. Okay, justice is everyone goes to hell, period, without question. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Okay, now, whoever believes in him, totally exclusive. It's all based on faith and belief. Whoever believes in him, um, uh, does, uh, I'm sorry, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people loved darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. I mean, read that John 3.16 in its context. You know, it, it, it doesn't simply say that God saves everyone. That would be universalism. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That means everybody in the world has an opportunity to believe in Jesus. And yet we see people like the Pharisees that have Jesus in front of them. He works mighty miracles. He heals people. He casts out demons. He does things that only God can do and they don't believe. Well, how's that possible? How's it possible that someone who actually saw that happen doesn't believe? And Peter says very clearly, let's go over to Peter again. Let's go to 1 Peter and let's look at the second uh, chapter. Um, the, and, and this is what Peter says, For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, one chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Now listen to this. They stumble because they were, because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. I, what, what does that say? I mean, you got to deal with that. That's scripture, okay? And it's straightforward scripture. You can't just simply throw that out because you have the presupposition or the preconception that you're the one who decides your eternal. Now, now let me just back up a little bit. 
okay? Because if, 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 you, if you think, as most people in the evangelical world do think, if you think that what God did was sent His Son into the world to die a horrible death, to pay for the sin of everyone, all the people, because that's what He would have to have done, to have died that death and suffered the wrath of God for every single sin of every single person. But that punishment only becomes effective if I choose Jesus. Okay? Do you see that? Now, if you, if you accept that, you must at least consider the possibility that no one believes. If God has nothing to do with it, it all has to do with these fallen sinful people. He sends His Son Jesus to suffer the most extraordinary agony and no one believes it's all for nothing. Could that possibly be God's plan? Could He possibly have sent His Son into the world to die that horrible death, pay for everyone's sin, and then everyone rejects Him? Unless He is the one who chooses and Jesus died for those that would believe in Him. He came to die for those who are His. My sheep know my name and they hear my voice. Okay? I've read all your scriptures. I, I guess right now I am a little... I mean, I, I know that God is real. I know that He exists because, my God, I, I have experienced Him so many times. I guess, the, the, you know, the, the part that I am hung up on is that He draws them and predestined to me. But then again, you know, I don't have the mind of God. Well, what just, I mean, what God does mm -hmm. is He speaks to you mm -hmm. through His Word. Mm -hmm. He doesn't speak to you through, through, through your own thoughts. And your own, although much of evangelical America thinks that that's true. God speaks to me. He told me this. It's not what's in Scripture, but I believe what God told me. No, actually, that's your mind. It's not the authority that we have, which is in Scripture. So my encouragement to you is to just take time searching for a definitive statement in Scripture that says, even though you were dead and lost in your trespasses and sins, even though you're at enmity with God, without the conversion of the Holy Spirit, I believe. Okay. And you, you will find thousands to the other side where the Holy Spirit changes hearts. You must be born again, he tells Nicodemus. That all comes from the Holy Spirit changing people's hearts. Well, if it's if, if, if you have to look to Scripture and say, am, am I basing what I believe on Scripture or am I basing it on what my preconceptions are, my presuppositions are? And, and, and that's, I know it's heavy and, and I know it's mind-boggling and, and, and sometimes it changes people's uh, uh, thoughts about God, that God could choose some and not choose others, you, you know? But how else is it possible that some people accept him and some people don't. If indeed, it's, it's, it's something that God draws people to. So just look, look in Scripture. Read, those, read, read chapter 9 of Romans. Okay? Just, I mean, just go ahead and read. You, you can't get any clearer than that. Read chapter 6 of John. Okay? I mean, these are New Testament Scriptures. Re, re, read the book of, Elysian, uh, of Galatians. Read Ephesians 1 the first chapter of Ephesians, okay? Read them and see what they are telling you about this. I mean, and I think what you'll find is that, okay, because I think it doesn't make it so, if I truly want to follow what Scripture is telling me, then I have to yield to Scripture, even if I completely don't understand it. But let, let, let me go ahead and, and kind of draw this to a close with this. Okay, we don't know God's ways, and, and we don't know why He does what He does. And, and what He asks us to do is to trust Him. Okay, he's, he's infinitely holy, meaning we can't comprehend His holiness, and, and, and He cannot abide sinfulness, and He's infinitely just, but at the same time He's infinitely merciful and gracious and loving and compassionate. 
okay, if we expected him to be someone we could put into our own little brains and figure out, then he's really not God. Okay, so realize that he's bigger and greater than we, 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 we can possibly imagine. And also realize that he's infinitely fair, okay? As, as Will says, fairness is not what we get. You don't want fairness. You, you don't want justice. You don't want what you deserve. What you want is his grace. And the Bible is clear that he extends grace. Grace is not grace if you did something, okay? And, and if, if you're the one that chose Jesus and, and sitting next to you is a brilliant mind that rejects him, what does that say about you? Uh, are you clever? Are you smarter than them? Are you more righteous than them? What, what, what made you choose Jesus and this brilliant person that hears the exact same gospel that you hear and rejects it? You, you, you see, you're putting all of the, uh, of, of the ability to make that decision on yourself and, and robbing it from the place that it is, which is really God's glory and, and His grace. Uh, and, and I granted, election, predestination, the foreknowledge of God, these are difficult things for us to comprehend. But my, my encouragement is don't listen to me. Don't listen, to, read it in the scripture. Go to the scripture and, and, and dive into it without your preconceptions and say, okay, speak to me. Speak to me because what we know about God is a mixture of his word and his illumination of his Holy Spirit. Um, the, the, and, and those are hard personal family situations. I doubt there's anyone here that doesn't have a similar situation in their family. Okay, we all have that. But n neither of my biological brothers uh, are, are they're just abs absolute abject don't believe. Okay, and don't try, to, don't try to convert me. Don't even talk to me about Jesus. So we all have that same situation, but just because I want them to come to Jesus doesn't mean I change what is said here, or, 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 or I read it differently, or I put on a pair of glasses that interprets it one way. Um, I, I, I trust in God to be the loving, compassionate, fair God, and I trust in Him to be beyond me, who can be both judgment and love at the same time. That's what we just learned last week about the gospel. It's both. Hey, listen, if you don't accept Jesus Christ, you're going to hell, okay? But at the same time, God humiliated himself to become a God so that we could be saved. And he places it before us. Now, what Will is saying is that without the movement of the Holy Spirit in your life, you reject it. There's no way you're going to believe in, in him. Why? In other words, look at the example we just got. Je Jesus goes with a bunch of the elders of Capernaum, the most righteous men on earth at that time, or at least thought they were. He goes to the most sinful man on earth, which is a Roman centurion, to heal his, his um, um, servant. Now, the Jews completely misunderstand this, and they say he's worthy because he gave us money, because he built us a, a synagogue. Completely external. These are supposedly God's chosen who are in the process with him standing right in front of them. And he says, just say the word and your servant is healed. And that very moment, the servant is healed. Okay, they're there. They're, they're in the process and they don't believe. 
Jesus later on says it. Why don't they believe? Because God gave them a spirit of deafness and blindness so that hearing they cannot hear the truth and seeing they cannot see the truth. That's, that's God. It's, it's throughout Scripture, old and new. It does, it's, it's, there's, if you look for it, it's easy. Now, don't worry if it troubles you. When I first came face to face with this, it was like, wait a minute, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> and, and, and honestly, I'll be in to my shame, to my shame as a pastor. I said many times from that pulpit, um, I don't like the doctrine of predestination, but I teach it and preach it because it's the truth, because it's what Scripture says. But I am so ashamed of myself for ever saying that, because how could I possibly say that something that is indeed God's decretive will, His glory of all the people to have chosen me and to given me the insight that He's given me for me to ever say, I don't like His doctrine. In fact, we are told that when we get to heaven, everything will switch. Rather than saying, God, you're not fair, we will be totally on the other side of that situation because we will see the mercy of God that was extended and these are people that really in their hearts did hate God. You know, which, you know, we'll get to heaven when we see that. Yes, Will. I just want to make sure that we're not making an error about the, when we talk about God's dispositional will, that we are, we are very specific that when we're talking about that dispositional will, about that he doesn't want any to perish, we're talking about specifically the elect people. No, not necessarily. Because, well, yeah. it, that, they would never put the tree in the garden knowing what was going to happen in the future if that's not. Well, that's, that's the nature of the dispositional will. Okay, it's separate from his decretive will. In other words, you have dispositions. We all have dispositions, things that we might prefer. Be honest with you, I, I used to enjoy beer and I wouldn't mind having a beer. I abused it, okay? I can never have one. But it doesn't mean that I wouldn't like to on occasion. There are certain things that lend themselves to it, right? But that disposition because of, a, of, of the perceptive nature of that, I can never go there. So my disposition is, is might be different than, um, uh, than than through this. Probably not a real good example. Uh, my disposition might be that I would love to have have bought that school over there and moved into it because I saw all kinds of wonderful things happening because of it, right? And and and, I, and that was my disposition. But because it wasn't the perceptive or the decretive will, it would have been a disaster. And we've already seen it. By the way, I hope you guys can see, can see that, that God showed us without question. We, we prayed to him. We asked him what we should do. He told us that there's something around the corner that you can't see. And what that was is that we would be bankrupt right this moment yeah. if we had bought that. If we had bought that, we would be bankrupt today, both in the school and in the church. We have been hit with that many unforeseen expenses within weeks of, uh, of, of, of making that decision. So, I mean, he didn't mess around. He, he showed us, right? $36,000 increase in our insurance, property insurance. Six figures it's going to take us to fix this air conditioner, okay? I, I mean, just boom, boom. You know, uh, I, I mean, can you imagine Brandy's daughter is very sick and they're down in the hospital in Miami, and if we were trying to put that thing together right now, we're talking total disaster, and God saw it, and we couldn't, and so therefore we, we, we bent to His will. Now, my disposition was different than that. I wanted that to happen, but that's not what we did because God showed us elsewise. Would you, so, but you, we're not saying that God decrees things that... will. And his disposition. But here's, here's the thing. He decreed from all eternity past that Jesus would go to the cross. That's his, his decretive will. That is from all eternity past written that that's the way it's going to be. His preceptive will states that here's my law. Okay? 
that the heart that follows the law will be saved, the heart that, that sins will die. For, you know, the wages of sin is death. All right, that's, that's the, the perceptive law. So God sends his son, decretive, to die on the cross to make it possible that another decree is made. And, and this is where it really starts getting kind of, 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 of crazy. Because if you were to go, we talked about this yesterday morning, if you were to go and stand before a magistrate, your own parent if it was, and you had killed someone and the law stated that the fair, the, the, the perceptive response is the electric chair. So guess what? You're going to the electric chair unless, unless there was another decree over here that stated that if you believe in this and repent, then your sin of murder will be forgiven and you don't pay the penalty that you should. It's no less a decree than that is, no less a precept than that is, but it is one that cancels that one out. And that's the beauty of what God did. He makes a new decree, a new precept, and not new from all eternity past, but he states, as we just read in John 3, that if you will believe in my son, even though you deserve to go to, to, to hell, even though by according to my original decree and the precepts based on that decree, now my disposition has nothing to do with it because I don't want any of you to go to hell, but here's my decree and here's my precepts. You have broken that. Justice says you go to hell. But now, unless, unless I can atone for those sins. Now, how am I going to atone for a sin against an eternal being? It's got to be an eternal being. So there's no one else who's possibly going to be able to fill that except the Son of God himself. So I decree from all eternity past, written right here in Peter, that it was decided before the foundation of the world that Jesus would be the Son of God who would come and die on a cross. That is my decree. My precept is whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Okay, so that is the cancellation, if you will, of that. Okay, the, the, the soul that sins must die yeah. unless you believe in my son who I sent for the specific purpose of saving you. And if you trust and believe in him, my precept says, my preceptive will is that you are no longer held accountable for your sins. You are forgiven. Now, my dispositional dispositional will, my disposition, is that everyone would believe in my son. Not everyone's going to. How does that happen? By his decree. By his decree. Okay. He's decreed the elect and the Right. And that's what the Bible says. Okay. So his disposition is not, and, and that's what it is, it's a disposition. God has dispositions just like we, like we have, and he states it here. It is not my desire, it is not my dispositional will, my disposition, that anyone would fail to repent, not believe in my son Jesus Christ, and be saved. I sent him so that you could be saved. But guess what? Unless I intervened, according to Romans 9, none of you would accept him. And therefore he would have died for the sins of all humanity, paid the most extraordinary price, and no one would be going to heaven. That wasn't his plan. That wasn't his decree. His decree is that those that I have set aside as mine are going to come be with me. Behold, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am there you may be also. Okay? That's all. So. Is there something else called this secret? There are multiple names for each one of these. There's the perfect will, there's the secret will. Uh, uh, you know, th th there are interpretations of many things throughout Scripture. I, I am doing a very poor job of, uh, of representing Dr. Sproul's um, dissertation on the three that are the most pronounced in Scripture. And that's the decretive, the um, perceptive, and the dispos dispositional. <laughs> Could you perhaps use... 
depends on whether you are a supralapsarian or an infralapsarian. <laughs> In other words, did God decree that Jesus would go to the cross before or after the sin? Basically, that's that's part of it, um, from all from all eternity past. Uh, okay, so let's look at that because Adam and Eve are the only two people who have ever lived who actually had free choice, complete free choice. God made them perfect with the potential of of sin. Okay, He did not make them like puppets on a string. He made them so that they could make that choice. Now, those who really think this through, and people are divided on it. Um, if God ordains something, does that not mean it must go come to pass? And so there's that big fight between supra and infralapsarians about what came, comes first, the chicken or the egg. And I don't believe anyone's ever really going to figure that out. That's a more complex argument, by the way, than the way I just presented it. Um, but, um, but basically, if you really want to look at it that way, God decreed his decretive will and his preceptive will. He decreed that everything would be okay that's his decree everything is that 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 he decreed it he made all the universe in the beginning of Genesis his decretive will he willed it into being now when he created and put the the tree in the garden the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that he created a precept my preceptive will Adam and Eve is that you do not eat of that tree Okay? That is uh, a commandment because the day you eat of that tree, you will surely die. There will be consequences. So that was perceptive, very similar to the Ten Commandments. However, those two had the free choice to make the decision whether or not they would remain sinless or fall into sin. You see, we're the opposite. Okay, we don't have that because we are born with a sinful nature. All right, so where did the temptation come from and why was there already evil in the world? And is evil beyond or outside the will of God? The existence of Satan and his rebellion against God? Is this something that is within the decretive will of God, or is it it's something that was a mistake on God's part? Well, actually, he can't be sovereign, and for it not to be his decretive will, that evil will exist. Now, the, 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 the way, again, that's the big question of theology, and we're really getting deeper and deeper here. But basically, I would happen to agree with John Gershner, a well, great theologian, um, the mentor of R.C. Sproul, who says there's no such thing as evil. Evil doesn't exist because evil cannot exist and God be sovereign. Okay, And he spells it out. He says there is good good, which is God. There is good evil. There's evil good, which is our interpretation of evil. Then there's evil evil. Absolute evil, yin and yang evil stands over and against God that God has no control over, can't be, and God be sovereign. So therefore, in his estimation, evil, evil doesn't exist. It's evil to us, but it's not evil to God. Evil is the absence, it's the privation of uh, of, uh, of, 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 God, of, of obeying God. It, it's, it's anything that's not the, the following of God. So it's really almost not an entity in and of itself. It's the, it's the lack of something. Okay. But again, don't, 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 please don't try to put your mind around that because the greatest minds, you know, and I've told the story many times. I'm at a lecture with John Gerstner and a student asked him that. And that's where I got my, my line that I use with you guys a thousand times. He says, I can answer that in three words. I don't know. Okay, and that's where I got that line. Because a student asked him, how did evil come into the world? And, and that's his answer. We, we just don't know.
God is perfect in His holiness. Okay? That means something that we cannot even begin to imagine, what it means to be perfect in His holiness that, like God is. That means there's not a blemish, not a spot, not a dent. He's light and in Him there is no darkness. He's absolutely perfect in His holiness. That means that any sinfulness against Him is an egregious, eternal transgression. Okay? In His compassion, He might say, okay, um, I, I, I'll, I'll let you go this time. I'll slap you on the wrist and send you home. And, and that's what most people think of God. He's just like this cosmic grandfather that sort of winks at you when, he, when you do wrong. But if God is holy, He can't do that. So therefore, He is just. And justness is not grace. Justice means that you commit the, sign, you commit the crime, you do the time, basically. That, that, that is it. There's no eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. It, it's re, re, retributive, re, re, retribution. Um, you, you know, it, it, it's, it, it, there's retribution for what you do. So yes, um, his, his dis, dispositional word, uh, will is he would rather us, um, everyone accept. But the fact of our sinfulness stands in our way. And, and we also, don't forget, according to Genesis 3, we're cursed. I mean, those were curses that he passed out against the snake, the woman, and the man. All right, so we are not, we're under the curse of God. And that's why Jesus became a curse for us when he hung on the tree. Okay, so it, it's not something arbitrary. <laughs> it's something that all of humanity is cursed. And, and can that which is cursed all of a sudden become righteous? You know? The, yeah. the attribute of God that is justice. If you're getting at why does evil exist? No, that, that, that's, well, that's one of the good reasons that evil exists, because of the nature of God. Justice, justness, holiness, compassion, love, forgiveness, grace, none of that happens outside of a, a, a humanity that sins against Him. None of that happens unless there's evil in the world. And so therefore, why does evil exist? So that God can show us the attributes that otherwise are never going to be seen. Wow. Now, would it be to show us or show? Like, I, we are not the. Not uh, elevate us to like God needed us to do anything. No, He doesn't. Like, is He showing Himself? Well, no, because remember, we're not the only beings in the universe. Well, yeah, the angels. There's myriads upon myriads, innumerable numbers. There's principalities. There's all kinds of things out there we don't know about. He needed to show it to them. And he wanted to show it within himself, so he created them. Um, the, 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 the process of why God created the world is a very difficult one and one I can't answer. What, what, what's going on between the Godhead that would cause that, that which is totally self-contained yeah. to create a world? And, and, and create angels and create heaven and create earth and create all these things. Why would he do such a thing? I, 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 can't, I can't even imagine. I would think it's to, so he could die for someone. Like, but he doesn't need anyone. He doesn't need us. Mm -hmm. he, he doesn't need us. He doesn't need to show us anything. He doesn't need us to love him. He doesn't need to love us. That's the biggest expression of love, right? To, to die for somebody. He said, like, so God can put no expression in himself. You are you are you uh, are um, 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 going into places from which there is no return. Uh, I, you know, really, there's 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 nothing out there. There really isn't because Scripture doesn't tell us what, what what's out there. And and those are all great brain teasers, but we just don't have the answers. You know. Yes, ma'am.
it's soli deo gloria, to God alone is the glory, okay? And, and so it's much more of a focus. It's not what I think of him, it's not what I did, it's not my work, it's his work. And so it's all about him. And then what he wants us to do is trust him. Even if it doesn't look like, even if it doesn't look like, you know, when you've got a brother who's, re you know, re rejecting him, it doesn't look like he's doing his job. God, why aren't you fixing this thing, you know? And, and, and he just says, trust me. Trust me that I know what's best. And, and, and even if you completely don't understand it, just trust me. Okay? That's what faith is. Okay, guys. Um, uh, uh, I, I, the, the, the chow line back there is getting anxious. Um, as, well, I'm just kidding. I wasn't pointing at you. I was pointing at Kay. Um, uh, uh, but anyway, actually, I was pointing at both of you. Uh, yes, Michael. Keep praying till the fat lady sings. There you go. So we're bringing all the way back. So now, does, does everybody know what that expression means? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's opera. Okay. The, when an opera is over, it's when the fat lady sings. Because they were always like this, the, with the Viking horns on, you know. That, that was when you knew an opera was over, when the fat lady sings. All right. So, it's not over till the fat lady sings. I just want to say, like, the day that I gave you that... my experience raised in a Southern Baptist Arminian church uh, all those days, I rejected when I began to try to reason it out and look at what scripture says, I rejected it because it didn't add up. And it wasn't until, of course I didn't know the Lord, it wasn't until my heart was changed and I was introduced to God's sovereignty that all of a sudden it's just like boom, okay, now it all fits. Now it all makes sense and I can make sense out of all of it. So. Yeah. Yes. Amen. Okay. Well done. Let's, uh, let's uh, pray and then we'll try to put up some of these chairs and break down and go home. Okay. Father, what a wonderful conversation we have had. I, I just pray that um, the, the information that has been shared um, is accurate. Um, Lord, we do uh, depend so much on your word as part of, uh, of who we are, solely, sola scriptura, um, that, that we believe in Scripture alone as our authority and, and no other place, no other authority. The Holy Spirit illuminates that Scripture for us. And just keep us close to that, Lord, because it is so easy for us to begin to, to, to reason this or that. And, and, and we almost always find ourselves uh, going in the wrong direction. So you have proven to us, you have shown us that, um, that you're, you're paying attention to our prayers, you're, you're noticing what we do, and that if we turn to you, you will indeed give us guidance. And so we just pray that that guidance will continue. Thank you for those who have gathered uh, here today. I thank you for those who are watching this later on or are now by the stream. And, and we just give you the glory. And keep us safe as we go home. Bring us back together to worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. God bless you guys, and God bless you.